<clears throat> okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. All right. Um, so just a few announcements. Um, as we uh, noted on Slack, so I hope you're all on Slack. The first problem set is on the website and you should feel free to ask questions and section or on Slack or in the discussion sessions that we have on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Um, what else? Um, yeah, so I've also put notes under the reading section of the Canvas site. There are notes on Fermi liquid theory, there are notes on superfluidity by, written by others, uh, and also uh, something on BCS theory. Um, of course, these two topics, or these three topics are very standard topics and many, many books on them. Uh, the StatMec book by Patria is a discussion of the Boglibov theory and, uh, you know, a nice compact uh, discussion of BCS theory, the way I'm presenting it here is in the book by Tinkum, for example. But, you know, you have a choice of many, many other things to look at. All right, so today we are going to continue our discussion of uh, BCS theory. So what we consider uh, is a Fermi liquid in the presence of uh, a weak attractive interaction uh, between the fermions. So this minus U naught is the attractive interaction. This is some describes some Fermi liquid. Uh, and we limit the attraction to be only present uh, when the energies of these fermions are within some window of the Fermi level. That's not really necessary, but it just allows us to simplify the formula. And also, in fact, uh, as shown later, uh, that, that the whole theory becomes exact in that limit. So the main idea uh, is that we start from this Hamiltonian uh, and then we condense uh, pairs of fermions. So you take two electrons with net zero momentum and net zero spin uh, and assume they form a bound into a boson-like object, which we call the Cooper pair. Uh, and then we just take the zero momentum component of the Cooper pair boson. It's zero momentum because the Kn minus K add to zero and put in a macroscopic occupation of that Bose operator. Uh, so that's the basic idea. Uh, and, and as in the Bogolibov theory, we do that simply by uh, replacing this combination of operators and its emission conjugate uh, by uh, by a number, which we just call this. So this is, this becomes a uh, shorthand for some complex number. So when you do that with this uh, BCS, uh, with this Hamiltonian, uh, you get this uh, famous uh, Hamiltonian here, which is has only terms that are quadratic in the Fermi operators. There's the kinetic energy, and there are these famous pairing terms, which don't conserve uh, fermion number or the Cooper pair number, but that's we are okay. We we already met such terms in the theory of the Boglibov superfluidity, and so we know that's not so dangerous. Uh, and uh, and this number delta, which is defined to be exactly this, will turn out to play an important role uh, in our discussion today. It's the energy gap, as we'll see, to breaking a boson into two fermions. Uh, and has to be determined self-consistently. That is, you assume a certain value of delta, then you diagonalize this effective Hamiltonian, uh, and, and then you in that Hamiltonian, you determine the expectation value of this operator. Oh gosh, what happened there? Um, you determine the expectation value of this Hamiltonian in H effective. Uh, and then you get a new delta. And if you did it right, the new delta will be the same as the old delta. If it isn't, you keep iterating until you converge to a solution. Okay, so they're actually going to do that calculation today. Uh, so this particular Hamiltonian has many names, I guess. Most generally, it's called the bogolibov dijen Hamiltonian. Uh, it can be generalized also to a situation uh, where this delta becomes a position of space, a function of space. Uh, which is what Dijen did. Uh, and then you have a more complicated problem to solve. Delta is some slowly varying 
position of space, function of space. Uh, and there's an enormous amount of physics in this, and some of it only discovered recently, just by solving this very simple, innocent looking set of equations. Uh, you can discover, for example, Majorana fermions for certain superconductors, uh, uh, all kinds of topological states, and so on. So we're going to meet much of that uh, in this course. Uh, but for now, we're just going to solve it for the simplest case of what we call S-wave pairing, where delta is just a constant, independent of everything. Uh, and that's the simplest BCS case. All right, so that's a summary of where we are. Any questions? Okay, good. So let's proceed then. So now we have to solve this problem uh, in this uh, defined by this uh, purple box. Uh, and so step one is to assume we know delta and find the eigen states of H effective or HBDG. Let me put that also over here. This is sometimes called HBDG for Boglibov Dijen. Yeah. Um, okay, so how do we diagnose this? Well, we met something like this before uh, when we had boson. This is exactly the structure of the final Boglibov Hamiltonian, which didn't conserve boson number. Uh, we had a constraint that the momentum of the bosons had to be not equal to zero. Uh, there's no such constraint here because fermions by themselves don't condense, so they are allowed to really have their occupation number is a smoother function of momentum. Okay, so way we diagnose this is by introducing a new set of operators, which we now call again going to call the gamma, as we did before, which and make the fermion with momentum p and spin up a linear combination. Of, uh, of a gamma fermion with momentum p and spin up, and uh, and a anti fermion or a hole, if you wish, uh, which is has momentum minus p and spin down, and that kind of makes sense. Uh, you know, here you're removing a particle momentum p and spin up. Here you're adding a particle momentum minus p and spin down. The net effect is to do the same thing in terms of conserving spin and momentum. Uh, and uh, we also define something for C dagger of minus P, uh, which we choose to be this way. Uh, and now the main, so these UP, VP, we've already met before. Uh, we'll find these are now cosines and sines rather than cosh and cinch as we had before, uh, because we're dealing with Fermi operators, not Bose operators. So this is just some kind of canonical transformation of Fermi operators. This is the inverse, you know, you assume uh, that we're going to assume that UP squared plus VP squared equals one. And then you can find out, you can easily check that this matrix is just the inverse of that matrix. So it's, we've done it in matrix formalism here. We could have also done the Boglibov theory in matrix formalism. And now you can check by doing just a simple bit of algebra uh, that these gammas are canonical fermions. That is, if these C is anti-commute, uh, then the gammas are also anti-commute. Okay. So this, uh, and this works here, uh, you know, they've just cleverly chosen this for this to work out right. If this is actually a unitary matrix, so you do a unitary transformation uh, and this, the relationship, if you've done it for the bosons, you know, we've got u squared minus v squared equals one. That's why we chose cosh and cinch. And for fermions, you get u squared plus v squared equals one. And that turns out to be what's needed uh, to make these anti-commutators work out correctly. So I urge you to just go through the algebra and check that that's all okay. So then we take this, uh, this expression uh, and insert it in the Boglio of Dijon Hamiltonian, keep expanding it, uh, and then you get all kinds of terms. Uh, gamma, dagger, gamma, 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 dagger, gamma, dagger. Uh, but then we want these gamma, gamma, and gamma, dagger that terms to vanish. Uh, and then you find they vanish, uh, provided UP is sine theta, VP is sine cos theta, and sine two is equal to this quantity. 
Okay, so this, you, you may remember a similar formula that we had for the Bose case where this was, uh, I think, a cinch, and now it's a sine, that's all. That's the main difference between the fermions and boson in, in this kind of canonical transformation. So the final, the final uh, uh, Hamiltonian turns out with this very simple expression where uh, EP, uh, this is written implicitly implied here, but a, a very important equation, I guess it's also here. Uh, EP uh, is, capital EP is the, is the sum and quadratures of little EP and delta. Okay, so this is always by definition greater than zero. Uh, and this is our Hamiltonian in terms of gamma, dagger, and gamma. Uh, and this tells us that the ground state, the lowest energy state, will win all of these states, these new fermions, uh, are empty. So this is the new condition for the ground state. The ground state of this Hamiltonian is the vacuum of the Bogolyubov particles. Uh, that's the same is also tr true for the Bogolyubov Bose theory. And in your homework, you'll work out the consequences of this type of equation. Uh, and for now, I'm going, we can try to guess what does this mean? What is the state for which this is zero in terms of the original Cs, uh, the original uh, electronic operators here? Okay. Well, so, so we want to find now gamma P uh, is equal to from here, uh, you know, this, this particular combination of the C's, uh, UP times CP up minus VP times C dagger minus P down. So you want to find something for which when you hit some wave function here, that gives you zero. Well, we just make a guess uh, that this is the, this is the right uh, state. So this is the famous BCS wave function that we wrote it down initially, uh, product in all K, uh, I guess you want to take only one product product on k greater than or equal greater than zeros because the um, okay. and for each k you take a uk and a vk and with every time you have a vk you create a Cooper pair uh, with with that momentum k n minus k okay just add that to the empty state this is the empty state with no electrons. So this state, of course, doesn't preserve particle number, uh, but it turns out that for so any reasonable choice of UK and VK is dominated. It's very much like the grand canonical ensemble. Uh, there's some mean particle number uh, of which is of order of the size of the system, and the fluctuations in the particle number are of the square root of the size of the system. So it's as if particle number is pretty well preserved. Uh, but obviously it has many terms uh, where you either add a particle or don't add a pair of particles. Anyway, now it's easy to check just using the properties of UK and VK. Uh, and this again, I urge you to check. You, you take this gamma K, instead of the gamma K, you write this expression here. You take this expression, plug it in there, uh, act it on this state, and you'll find it zero even if I got, assuming I got all the uh, signs right. Okay. Um, and all right, so so we've now determined everything. Give, so what, we, what we've done is we assume, all we've done here uh, is assume the value of delta. We don't know what delta is, we picked the value of delta, and then we found the ground state wave function, uh, of this uh, Hamiltonian uh, and also all the excitation energies. We found the full spectrum of this Hamiltonian. This is the full spectrum here. Uh, and there's some, even the ground state energy, which we, I haven't written down an expression, uh, which one can compute. Okay, so we have everything, but the one thing we don't know is the value of delta. Um, okay, we'll determine that one minute, but before I go to that, let me, uh, amplify in this comment. Uh, so this wave function, it turns out, uh, is pretty much uh, tells us what this G, 
was way back when. So, so this now I'm going to, have to go back to our original discussion of BCS theory. You know, we, we said that, okay, the Cooper pair uh, is this, has internal wave function G of R, uh, which we then wrote in the following manner. So this was, this is what I said was the BCS wave function. Okay, so that's one form of the BCS wave function. Uh, it doesn't look like this function here that we've just obtained. Uh, um, where is it? It doesn't look like this function, but in fact it is. And let me now show you how that works. Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, this function here. So the screen is a little slower than my iPad. All right. So what, what I want to show you, this wave function is actually pretty much the same wave function that we started with. And, and the bonus of showing that is that you also then know what, a, what is GK. So to see that, uh, I'm sorry, I should have, I need to clean up these notes to, according to the present presentation, but we are going to go kind of backwards uh, from these notes, but it's here, okay. <laughs> All right, so this is what I claim is the BCS wave function here. But we obtained it. We just followed our nose and we got this wave function. Okay. Uh, but let's say, you know, we don't want a wave function with arbitrary particle number. We want, we want a wave function with a given particle number. Uh, so we'll just say that's uh, some projection operator the PN. And then I'm going to pull out a factor of UK. So when I pull out a factor of UK, uh, that becomes G, uh, I can rewrite this as this. So just to make that clear, we are going backwards in this presentation here. Sorry about that. Okay, we go from here to here, where GK is given by this, and that turns out to be the answer. And now I notice something about this operator. Uh, so this operator has the strange property that its square is zero. So square, the C dagger squared, it's the fermion, it's the exclusion principle. Its square is zero. So if you have some operator whose square is zero, uh, so this operator, this thing squared is zero. Uh, well, one plus X is then E to the X, okay? <laughs> All right, so I can write this operate, this expression here, and I can write, let me write on another intermediate expression, is projection onto N particle product on K of exponential of gk c dagger k up c dagger minus k down okay uh, that's true because the square of this operator is zero okay now these different operators for different k commute with each other so because of that I can now also use the famous identity that e to the x e to the x times e to the y is e to the x plus y. Uh, that's the famous identity for commuting operators. So these operators commute, so I can still use that. So then I finally, uh, let me, yeah, okay. Then I get to this thing. I can take the product on k, which is outside the exponential, and put it inside. And finally, I want to project into n particles. Now, now the projection to n particles is really simple. Everything here is exact. There's no approximation uh, once you start from this wave function. I want to project this to n particle. Well, just this is a series expansion. Do the expansion of the exponential. The only term that has n particle is with this thing is to the power n over two. And lo and behold, uh, that's the wave function we said uh, that you obtain if you take a bunch of Cooper pairs and just put them all in the zero momentum state. So, so the whole thing hangs together. Uh, this is in fact the naive wave function where you just take a bunch of fermions, pair them up and take that composite object and put it at zero momentum and take that to the power n over two. That wave function is written somewhat cryptically uh, by BCS uh, in this form here. Okay. But it's really nothing but that. Okay, and, and we also have learned what is GK. It's this thing. 
and VK and UK, we just determine them. Uh, oh, sorry, these are P's and not K's. Uh, there they are in terms of theta. So you can just all work it out once you know the number delta. So the only thing we need to know uh, is the value of delta, and then we are done. So any questions? Sorry, um, I had a question. I think maybe it was appropriate last time, but anyway, I'm going to ask it now. Go ahead. Um, so, yeah. um, I wonder, like, yeah, to sorry. what extent, uh, like, our interpretation of um, the pair as a boson um, holds, because the, the pair can't be um, occupied more than once, right? Like, because they're yeah. made of like, fermionic operators. But then we still use the mean field um, approximation from before, um, where we had, like, a large number of particles in the condensate. Right. Right. Wonder, like, right. So how... yeah, so the yeah, so the short answer is that as long as the Cooper pairs are well separated from each other, they commute, uh, and so in that sense they're bosonic. Uh, but yeah, strictly speaking, they're not bosons because uh, the commutator of psi 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 Cooper psi Cooper dagger is not one. It's it's equal to zero when they're far apart, but right on the same side is not one. Uh, it, certainly not for a weakly interacting Fermi gas. Um, so, you know, I guess the way to, uh, what I will say is that what I've, I've done today, you know, this route that PCS followed roughly that I presented here uh, is, makes no reference to boson. It's just a kind of a mean field theory where we allow for this pairing condensate. I have never used the fact that this, op this object is a canonical boson. I've never used any such property. All I've used is that it somehow acquires an expectation for it. That's really the only assumption I've made. And then what I've just showed you is if I just close my eyes and follow that procedure, I get a wave function, which I can transform into exactly the wave function I would assume, I would obtain if I just assume these were bosons that both condensed. <laughs> so this, if you can regard this as an a posteriori justification for my hand waving arguments uh, that I presented at the beginning of this chapter. But what I've done now is the correct, is completely a well-defined way to do it without making such assumptions of any canonical bosons existing anywhere. I, I see. And, and it's because this, you know, it's because this connection is a bit subtle, but that in the early days, in the 50s and 60s, nobody, I mean, people didn't understand it. Uh, you know, BCS certainly were not using that picture. They did, nowhere do they say that they're, what they're doing is bose einstein condensation of Cooper pairs. But it's smoothly connected to it. That's something we understood much later, which I've kind of built into my discussion, though. I, I see. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the modern point of view, which comes up again when we talk about other states like fractional quantum Hall states and many other states, is that, you know, if you define some composite operator, as long as they commute when their operators are far apart, uh, then that operator looks like a boson in the sense that you can condense it. And just by condensing different operators of this type, you can get all kinds of interesting quantum phases. Uh, and, and I'm trying to use that modern point of view in talking about the BCS work, who didn't quite use that point of view, of course. <laughs> and, uh, you know, hopefully I've shown you how by actually doing an honest calculation uh, with this mean field factorization, <laughs> Uh, we do get results consistent with that point of view. Sorry, I think I missed this. Um, why is the product only over k greater than zero? Oh, uh, wait a second. Uh, see, that, you're right. No, it shouldn't be because there's a k. I, I was worried about double counting, but no, because there's a k up. And when, uh, right, when k is minus k, you'll have the other part. Thank you. No, I don't need it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was just, so when I'm summing over positive K, say I get a particle spin up with momentum K. How do I get that particle with positive K and spin down? Well, when K is minus K, this term gives me a, a term, a particle with uh, spin down and positive K. Uh, 
when k is negative. Okay, so there's no double counting without the k. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yes, please do point out mistakes as I make them. <laughs> okay, so now the, the the one thing left is to determine delta, uh, and as we saw here, in you know when we factorize the original Hamiltonian, delta is just given by this uh, solving this final equation, which we haven't used at all. This equation here. So we have to determine this object in this Bogley Bob Dijano Hamiltonian and then solve this. This becomes a nonlinear equation for delta. All right, so we do that. Uh, so that's the same equation there. Uh, we write this operator uh, in terms of the gamma fermions. Now, here also we get gamma gamma terms and gamma dagger gamma dagger terms. And we do that, but we can throw those out, no problem, because the new Hamiltonian conserves the number of gamma fermions. It doesn't have any gamma dagger. That's how we chose them. So since the number of gamma fermions is conserved, the so-called anomalous terms which don't uh, conserve the number of gamma fermions will have zero expectation value. All right, so we get a term which is gamma, gamma dagger, and gamma dagger, gamma. Well, these are ordinary fermions with some uh, energy EK. So clearly gamma dagger gamma is just the Fermi function with energy capital EK and gamma gamma dagger is one minus that, which gives you this. Uh, so you insert this into this equation, use the values of UK and VK that we had before, uh, and we get the famous equation uh, for the energy gap. So this is the BCS equation uh, right here. Yeah, let me encircle it one more time. So we did one more thing here. We had a sum over k here. Uh, we had a sum over k, and we just converted that to an integral over E uh, times the density of states. We assume the density of states is pretty much a constant, so we pull it out of the integral. We don't put a d of e here. And furthermore, the energy only goes between omega and dy of the Fermi surface, because that's only the range in which the interaction u naught is assumed to be operative. And that's it. So now this, this whole expression only depends on this combination, u naught times the density of states, which is sometimes called lambda. Uh, let me use a different color here. So this thing up to a factor of two, which we'll get right now, is sometimes called lambda. It's the coupling constant or the electron phonon coupling constant. Uh, and E depends on delta here. So we just have to do this integral and put this on a computer and solve it. So the first thing you notice, there is a trivial solution of this equation. And that solution is delta equals zero. You can put delta equal to zero on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and the equation is solved. So that's the uh, uh, the so-called normal state or the Fermi liquid state, and it's always a permitted solution. But we then have to ask, is that the lowest energy solution? And it turns out it it never is, as long whenever you can solve this equation. It's just a fact that I uh, assert without detailed proof. And the way you figure that out uh, is actually by computing this quantity here, this ground state energy. Uh, so I haven't computed it, but you know, that could be a nice homework problem to figure out what it is. Uh, and that energy is always lower when delta is, has a solution where delta is non-zero. So, okay. So that's, it's because of this term that we have to pick the solution with delta not equal to zero. So therefore, we can now decide delta is not zero and we can just cancel this delta. Uh, and then now we have an equation for delta as a function of omega d pi temperature uh, and this coupling constant lambda, which yes, that's exactly what I said it was, good. All right, so that's just an equation you go ahead and solve. Uh, uh, and you know, so it's, let me just sketch the solution in two limits. Well, at first, I solve it as t equals zero. 
So at t equals zero, uh, the tench, since E capital E is always positive, uh, becomes a, a one. So now this is a simple integral with this thing in the denominator. Basically, that's what it is. Um, where the factor of two go, there's a factor of two here, uh, two here, which gets canceled by the minus omega d to omega d. So zero to omega d. And uh, so that's what the, because no lambda, okay, there's no lambda over there. The lambda is on this side. Okay, and in the limit when uh, omega Dubai uh, delta is much smaller than uh, omega Dubai, you can replace this by uh, an exponential. Uh, and therefore the solution of this equation uh, just becomes uh, here. So this is the famous equation, the BCS gap equation, uh, delta is two omega Dubai times e to the minus one over lambda. So when lambda is small, it's exponentially small. Uh, okay, and this is, so it's even, so omega Dubai in a, in a typical, like aluminum, omega Dubai might be 500 Kelvin, uh, but TC is a two or three Kelvin, and that's because lambda is very small. Okay, I forgot to actually say one thing. Uh, what is what is delta? Okay, we'll come back to that. Yeah, no, this is a good time to say it. So zero temperature. Uh, why is this thing not moving? Okay. Oh. Right. Well, let me make another page here. So what we have seen is that the energy excitation, EP, the square root of energy EP squared plus delta squared. So if I plot this as a function of P, and I go through the Fermi level, this is PF, uh, and this is just energy here, then uh, EP is a, you know, it's a paraboloid of some top, I mean a hyperboloid, it looks something like that. This is EP is square root of P squared plus delta squared. And so there's always what's called the, and this is the BCS gap, the famous prediction of BCS theory, that there's a gap to creating fermionic excitations, uh, which has magnitude delta. And, you know, this was one of their predictions, and it was Mike Tinkham, uh, who died a few years ago, who first measured this gap and found it had, you know, exactly the predicted value from uh, BCS theory uh, using optics. Okay, uh, so now you notice another thing, interesting thing to notice here is that the delta goes to zero, this function, uh, not drawing it too well, it's an asymptote to this curve. Uh, so this is the function at delta equals zero. Uh, EP is at absolute value of EP. And if you remember our, our discussion, our very first lecture, when we talked about a free Fermi gas and the excitations of a free Fermi gas in the grand canonical ensemble, this is exactly the curve we had. So on this side, we have the quasi particles uh, of a Fermi gas. And on this side, we had the quasi holes. And then there was a point, the Fermi surface, where the two uh, expressions met uh, and the energy vanished. So there was a no, no gap in a Fermi liquid. Fermi liquid was called a gapless system. Uh, here, there is a gap to fermionic excitation. So the, when you, this is the gap to breaking your pair apart. And there's a very tiny energy in a, in a BCS superconductor. It's only a few Kelvin, whereas uh, Fermi energy could be thousands, tens of thousands of Kelvin. And this is the exact opposite to something like uh, 
uh, you know, helium-4, you could ionize helium-4 into electrons and protons that cost electron volts of energy, uh, whereas the uh, condensation temperature is only a few millikelvin. Uh, and here is exactly the opposite. It's the ionization energy of a Cooper pair is much, much smaller uh, than the Fermi energy of the fermions, which is also, well, sorry. I didn't quite see. Yeah, it's much smaller than the Fermi energy, but it's not much smaller than the critical temperature, as we'll see in a minute. Okay, so then going back to this discussion, so that's what delta is. It's just the energy gap. And it's smaller than omega divided by this factor. Okay, now you can also solve this equation that as a function of temperature, uh, and you do it numerically on a computer, and you get some curve like this. Um, so, and it vanishes, and that's the critical temperature here. Okay, so what is that critical temperature? Um, well, so the way to get this point is to imagine delta is very small. So if I go back to this equation, I've already canceled delta, so I've assumed delta was uh, non-zero. But now I send it to zero very, very slowly, and so then this capital E just becomes E, I can drop this delta. So when I drop that delta, I get an equation for TC. So that becomes E, uh, and that's tanch of E over TC. This tanch is, of course, coming from uh, this tanch. Uh, okay. So this, you get this integral. Well, uh, we know already, let's assume omega divided by is much bigger than TC. So you can look up this integral in Gradstein and Rizek. Uh, and really, actually, this is one of the uh, places where physics depends on Euler's constant. You have to take both these terms uh, when you do this integral. Okay. So now we see that in terms of one over lambda, I have an equation for TC. So this gives me an equation for TC in the limit where TC is smaller than omega bar. Okay, you invert that, uh, and then you get the prediction for TC. Okay, so now I look at this formula for TC, including all the strange factors of two over pi and Euler's constant. And I look at the formula for delta. I divide one by the other. Uh, and then you get this famous prediction, which was already in the first BCS paper, uh, which is the ratio um, of the energy gap and the critical temperature. Uh, and it's just a pure number, it just happens to be 3.53. Uh, it's This is just, you know, this number here, three point, this strange number 3.53 uh, is the consequence, just a solution of this equation, that's it. Okay, uh, so that was a, a famous prediction. Uh, at the time, of course, people knew what TC was. Nobody knew what the energy gap was. I mean, people didn't even know that there would be such a thing as an energy gap in the BCA superconductor. There were just starting to be some experimental indications. It was very quickly, it was measured by optics and by NMR, and at least for the low, and it works beautifully. <laughs> this actually worked out, and uh, and that was, you know, convinced everyone that BCA has got it right. So this was, you know, a remarkable success of solid state physics, where you got an accurate predict numerical prediction in the weak coupling limit of a BCS superconductor. Uh, and the history of solid state physics since then is a history of many other, uh, you know, this is too good, really. It does, this kind of amazing success has not been repeated. It's, other problems are usually much harder, especially if you want to get such quantitatively tight predictions. Well. People eventually with big computers uh, have managed to make many predictions, uh, but nothing as beautiful and simple as this. Uh, okay. All right, I think that's all I have for BCS theory for now. Uh, as you discussed in the discussion section, and uh, uh, let me just iterate that here. So in this Fermi gas, there are two types of excitations. We found the ground state, which I claim is a superconductor with a condensate of Cooper pairs. 
that has fermionic excitations, which is given by this dispersion relation. But it also has the analog of the phonon excitations of the superfluid of bosons we found earlier. And those excitation corresponds to fluctuations in delta. So if I go back to this mean field Hamiltonian uh, and think about spatial variations in delta, uh, then you can get back the same kind of phonons. Sorry, it's moving a bit slow here. Yeah. So if we look at spatial variations in delta, uh, you can also get back the phonon excitations, at least for a, without Coulomb long range Coulomb interactions. And as you'll see in the homework, uh, if you put in the Coulomb interactions, at least for a Bose gas, uh, that, that phonon becomes a plasmon with a finite energy gap. And, that's, and that feature was one of the original uh, inspirations for the Higgs mechanism. Okay, all right, any other questions? Uh, yeah, in the expression where we had the sum, uh, sorry, the product over all K of UK and VK times the CK up and CK down, yes. uh, C minus K down dagger. If we want the excitations to be a singlet, is that implying some relationship between VK and V minus K? Uh, yes, it is, thank you. Yeah, so we're assuming that, uh, that VK is an even function of K, I believe. Uh, yeah, so it's an S wave pair so that if it's roughly speaking, if it's even in K in real space, it has to be odd in spin space and that makes it a singlet up, down, minus, down, up gives you a singlet, right? So. That's an assumption here. Yes, VK is V of minus K. Hi, okay. can, uh, can you really see the phonons in, in, the, in, this, uh, in this Cooper pair channel? Because I thought it's probably in the, in the density channel, right? Well, I mean, those channels all mix with each other because of the condensate of the I see. So particle there number. So there would be a non-zero overlap. Yeah. yeah. So we're shortly going to do something called Landau Ginzburg theory, which is an approximate way of dealing with these issues. Uh, you know, if you try to do it in the full BCS framework, it, these kind of questions become very complicated. Uh, at least formally, although conceptually, there's nothing that mysterious. Other questions? All right, so now the next chapter uh, is to go back to basics a little bit. So, you know, I've given you the theory of the weakly interacting Bose gas, and I've also given you the theory of the weakly interacting Fermi gas. Uh, and the net result is that they both uh, seem to have some kind of condensate uh, and uh, are superfluids and superconductors. But why is this thing? this beast, a superconductor. So what is it about that special? Uh, what is this off diagonal long range order? And why does that imply superconductivity or superfluidity? So that's the question I want to now address. Uh, so we really have, we want this chapter go back uh, and think a little bit more. Well, what is the meaning of broken symmetry? Uh, and how do we characterize it? Okay. So let's take a simple model that hopefully all of you have seen in your StatMac course, uh, which is the simplest example of a broken symmetry. So you take an Ising model, you know, some, uh, just to remind you what's an Ising model, uh, the partition function, sorry, Z of some set of spin spins of E to the um, beta J, sum of nearest neighbors, let's be in three dimensions, sigma i, sigma j, where sigma i equals plus minus one. Okay, so that's the famous Ising model. And we assume at low temperatures, it's all purely classical uh, so that there's a ferromagnetic moment. All right. So we take a box of this Ising model uh, of size length L, 
and some big cross-sectional area A. Uh, and then we, uh, yeah, we won't, you know, A is practically infinite, so we won't worry about the top and bottom boundaries, but let's look at the left and right boundaries separated by distance L. All right, so this blob will has a broken symmetry, so at low enough temperatures, all the spins will either point up or point down, okay. But what we're going to do is we're going to twist it. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a field uh, on the right boundary, uh, H, uh, sorry, yeah, what am I calling? This should be H. This notation is awful, sorry. <laughs> yeah, oh, that should be R belonging to the right boundary, H sub R on the right boundary, and this should be H sub L on the left boundary. Okay. Um, so this is our bare Ising model, H Ising is exactly this term over here. And then you put a Zeeman field, which on the right boundaries, let's say it, it, we're going to take H, H right to be up, wants the spins to be up, and on the left boundary, it wants the spins to be down. Okay. All right. So if if both boundaries point say up, then the spins, all the spins will also be up. Now, however, the boundaries point in opposite directions on the right, you know, even a tiny field on the boundary, and that's really the essence of symmetry breaking. Just a tiny perturbation changes everything because without the field, it's equally likely to be up or down. So if you put a less, tiny perturbation on the right boundary, everywhere on this near this boundary, all the spins will point up. And once these spins decide to point up, all their uh, neighbors will also point up. And conversely, on this side, all the neighbors will point down. So this means that if I have these opposite boundary conditions on the left and right, there's got to be a domain wall somewhere in between. Okay. So. So there's a rigorous quantity I can define, which is something like a surface tension. So I take this Ising model and I solve it exactly with two configurations. In one configuration, the left and the right boundaries uh, are the same. And so there's no domain wall in between. And the other configuration, uh, they are not the same. And then I ask, what is this difference in the limit of L and A going to infinity? <clears throat> Well, if I'm above the critical temperature where the spins are fluctuating wildly, you know, what I do on this boundary and what I do on the other boundary, which could be miles away, is of no relevance. They don't know about each other because there's no long range order or broken symmetry. So if I twist this boundary down and this up, it doesn't really matter. So what you expect then is that the free energy difference between twisted and non-twisted boundary conditions will be exponentially small. And how small? Well, in what is the argument of the exponent? Well, it's the length, how far these boundaries are, divided by some length scale, and that's called the correlation length. This is pretty much the definition of the correlation length. One of the best ways to formally define it, it's an exact definition that uh, if you have these twisted boundary conditions, this energy will decay exponentially as L goes to infinity in this manner. So it decays to zero. So this is above the critical temperature. Uh, we don't care about that. We want to go to low temperatures. At low temperatures, no matter how far apart these boundaries are, there's going to be an energy cost that depends on the cross-sectional area, which could be gigantic. So there's a term called the uh, proportional area. Uh, notice these are this is the total free energy. So this, the free energy, both of these two terms are of the volume of the system. They're L times A. But the difference is smaller than that. It's not, doesn't blow up with the volume. So it's only a surface effect. It blows up with the area. And the coefficient is the precise definition of the surface tension. So what, and this is really the precise, uh, you know, formal definition of what is symmetry breaking. This is, or in this case, a discrete symmetry of between up and down. That's broken by the Ising model and it, and it's, it means that there's a surface tension between twisted and untouched twisted boundary conditions. Anytime you have it, you say, well, you have long range order. Okay, so is that clear? So, you know, it's a matter of, it's a difficult computation to make, but if you can do this computation, measure the surface tension, <clears throat> you have learned something about, something non-perturbative about this broken symmetry state.
All right. <clears throat> so now we want to do the same kind of thought experiment with the Bose gas. <laughs> uh, <coughs> and come up with a definition of what is the superfluidity. So here is also useful to make an analogy with, with a solid. If I take a crystal, what is it that distinguishes a crystal uh, from a liquid? Well, both the liquid and the solid have a non-zero differential modulus. So what a solid has because of the broken translational symmetry is a finite shear modulus. If you try to shear the solid, uh, it requires more energy uh, than, uh, than a liquid. The liquid will just immediately flow. You couldn't shear it. All right. Uh, and that shearing action is pretty much analogous to this twisting boundary condition for the Ising model uh, and also for the Bose gas. So let's consider a Bose gas uh, where we have some, say, a Bogolyubov -Bog theory, but you know, some theory you solve exactly without any approximations in principle, you put on a computer, but you put boundary conditions. And these boundary conditions also, uh, it's sort of like a source or a field that acts on the Bose annihilation operator. Okay, so what is this? This means that you have a reservoir of bosons. You have some gigantic superfluid, which is a reservoir of boson, which is given by this eta L of R. Just, you know, even if you don't have one in the lab, it's Good to imagine you have such a such a beast that can just uh, at at will create a boson on the or annihilate or create a boson on the left boundary with some factor eta star. Every time you add a boson, the wave function gets that extra factor. So suppose we have such a some weak link some to some magic reservoir which can do this, and we do that also on the left and the right. Okay. So this is, it's like an atom laser because it's just sending in atoms all with the same phase factor, same factor eta L. So you have these atom lasers on the left and the right. Uh, and we just take eta left equals eta right times a twist. So this is really a twist, it's an angle delta theta. Okay, but as a theorist, here's a Hamiltonian, which doesn't conserve boson number. I mean, this term, conserves boson number, but this one doesn't. Uh, it has a definite phase of the bosons, and this is very analogous to the Ising model. This conserves, this is Z2 symmetric, spin go to spin down, but these are not. So we break it only on the boundary. So we break the symmetry and give a definite phase to the bosons only on the boundary. All right, so then we ask, uh, what is the free energy difference between a twist by an angle delta theta and no twist? So you can, it's a completely well-defined question. You can put on a computer and ask it to figure it out. All right, so what happens uh, is there's two possibilities. If you are in the normal fluid in a Fermi liquid, well, at least at finite temperature, not at zero temperature, this will decay exponentially. Um, you know, one in a Fermi liquid, if you did this twist, or sorry, a, a normal above the critical, if these are bosons, uh, it's the normal state, an ordinary liquid of bosons at finite, above the Bose-Einstein state condensation temperature. If you try to work this out, there's no question of decay exponentially. <clears throat> All right. Well, how about you're below the Bose-Einstein condensation temperature? Well, here it's not as simple as uh, the Ising model, where the answer is just proportional to the area. So what happens in the Ising model is there really is a very sharp boundary uh, because the spins are up and then they flip and then they go down. Uh, so there's a very sharp boundary and it's just a, literally a surface tension. But what happens uh, for a solid when you put a shear strain um, or in a superfluid where you put a twisted boundary conditions of the phase is that the gradient of the phase gets spread out. Okay, so let me so let me make a picture here. Uh, so here, uh, am I out of time? No, not yet. Almost done. Okay. So here's zero to L. So I have a boundary condition that the you know the phase points this way here, and maybe points this way there. 
So what is it going to do? Well, uh, it turns out the optimal configuration, just, just think of a solid where you try to shear it. But what happens to the shear strain is just uniformly spread out. So what will happen is that oh, this, this, uh, this twist will just happen very gradually and smoothly. So that theta of x just is a linear function uh, of some theta naught uh, times x over L. So theta naught is this angle here. Uh, sorry, that angle, theta naught. Okay. So just going to uniformly spread out. That will optimize the energy. That seems quite reasonable. Uh, so then what energy cost will there be? Well, the energy cost will depend uh, on the gradient of the phase. So what is grad theta? So grad theta now, oops, that theta is theta naught or delta theta over L. So gradient of theta squared is delta theta over L whole squared. So that's these two terms here this term and that term, that's just the square of that. And then it's proportional to the cross-sectional area, of course. So you have to multiply by A, and you also have to multiply by L because the gradient is acting everywhere. So there's some energy density everywhere inside. Uh, and, and okay, all right. So, so it must go this way. This is how it depends on the area and the length. And then there's a coefficient. So this coefficient is the most important thing in this chapter. It has many different names, sometimes called the helicity modulus or the superfluid stiffness. Sometimes it's also called the superfluid density, although it's not a density, uh, but it's a, it's a very precise uh, in number with certain dimensions, uh, which characterizes the superfluid state. Um, I prefer the word helicity modulus because it's really the, most precise definition of what you're doing, you're twisting boundary conditions. Uh, okay, so this we assume is a non-zero number. It's, it's the analog in a solid uh, of the shear elastic constant, which is non-zero. Okay, so now if I just take it, the whole object to be a cube, so that A goes to L to the D minus one, D is my spatial dimension. Uh, this is the very important result, the change in free energy for twist by an angle delta theta in a cube of size L uh, goes length to the power D minus two. So you're seeing this important appearance of D minus two, meaning that the two dimensions, things are a bit trickier. We will return to two dimensions later, but in three dimensions, this is some number that blows up with the size of the, uh, of the cube. It draws as the length of the cube, whereas the F itself went as the volume of the cube. So it's smaller than the energy in the Ising case where it went, went as L squared. So this was L squared, sigma L squared. Uh, but this is now rho S L. Okay. All right, so that's the helicity modulus. Uh, and uh, it's really the most fundamental property of a superfluid. It, it can be experimentally measured. Uh, uh, by it's in fact what's responsible for the Meissner effect, uh, but I think I'm out of time, so that'll be the next uh, uh, next class. Uh, how does this helicity modulus lead to superconductivity? Okay, questions. Yeah, Joanne, you have something. Can you explain the meaning of a, the name of a helicity modulus? Why helicity here? Well, because of twist. Helicity is another word for twist. So we're twisting the boundary conditions. And so it's, you could have called it a twist modulus. I think Michael Fisher is responsible for this name. Uh, this particular precise definition didn't appear till much later. BCS never used it. Uh, but once, you know, so like I'm saying, the connection with both condensation, broken symmetry, it took a while before that was properly understood. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it all, you know, you can also apply this not just to, uh, uh, to superconductivity, you can apply it to spins. Suppose you have some spins that are forming uh, 
effects. And this is in fact what happens in uh, in graphene in experiments in uh, Emilio Covey's uh, lab. Uh, you know, you have a ferromagnet in the XY plane and you can twist it. Uh, and you have, again, the, you have, they measure the analog of what they call the superfluid density of this twisted spin. They call it spin superfluidity. Uh, and, and the coefficient here is this helicity modulus. Yeah, so I, that's just historical reasons, but that's, it's the name I prefer that is most accurate among the names, many different people's name used for it. BCS. Thanks. Yeah, people call it a thing called superfluid density, but what they call the superfluid density is in fact not the superfluid density. It's not this. It's a kind of an arbitrary quantity that you can't be measured. This is a very precise quantity which uh, can be measured. As, and also you can see from here, it has very fixed dimensions. It has dimensions of energy times length to the two minus d. And theta, you know, there's no ambiguity about theta. Theta is the phase. It's whatever the variable that has period two pi. You can't rescale it. It's just a dimensionless number that has period two pi. Uh, so there's no ambiguity about theta. It's of course defined mod two pi. <laughs> D is a dimensional space or space time. Excuse me, sorry for this. Uh, this is the dimension of space. Oh, yes, no problem. I agree, thank you. Hey, Sivir. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I've heard this theory, I've heard like a, that there's a theorem that says, you know, you can't have like a continuous symmetry broken spontaneously in 1D. Is that related to this D minus two exponent? Yes, so the theorem is precisely that you can't have a continuous symmetry broken at non-zero temperatures in two spatial dimensions mm -hmm. or for certain relativistic systems at zero temperature in one dimension. So, so there's a trickery. Are you talking about space time or space? Uh, so if it are at zero temperature or non-zero temperature. So uh, at zero temperature, you can break certain symmetries even in one dimension, uh, but others you can't. And we, when we do the theory of lattice of liquids, we are going to go through this in much greater detail and the costless Thales theory. Uh, so right now I'm talking about non-zero temperatures, let's say, uh, and then this is a statement about two dimensions. If you want to apply it to relativistic systems in one dimension, then then d would have to be replaced, little d would have to be replaced by the space-time dimension, and then would apply to the case you're referring to. I see. Okay. Yeah. So, so at zero temperature, this d minus two would become d minus one for relativistic systems. I see. So, so does this like L to the D minus two tell us anything about like this, you know, superfluid ordering in one dimension? It tells you you have an issue, but okay. how, it doesn't tell you how to work it out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and this is the problem that costless and Thales uh, first understood properly. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Could you quickly please clarify like the behavior or the role of the phase for a normal fluid above TC? Um, well, I mean, it's, it, it's not a very well defined quantity because it's fluctuating a lot. You know, it's like saying, suppose I take a magnet above the critical temperature, what is the magnetization? Well, <laughs> it's just fluctuating all over the map. Uh, but still, I can still define this 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 problem. So in this problem, I have some system maybe at finite temperature. This is just a normal Bose gas or something, anything you want. But I'm coupling it to a reservoir, and in the reservoir, I still have a phase. Okay, so the reservoir is somehow some very special object where I can fix the phase, which has a very you know, I've cooled the reservoirs, the left and the right reservoirs. I've cooled them, so there there's a phase, and this reservoir is emitting particles with different phases on the left and right boundaries into the bulk. And once they go into the bulk, the particle just lose memory of where they came from because it's a normal fluid, so it's not very well defined. And that's why uh, the free energy here will, will be, there'll be no difference whether you have a twist or not, it'll just decay exponentially with the size. Okay, got it, thank you. So, 
So we are only assuming here in this derivation that the phase is well defined in the reservoir. I'm not assuming it's well defined in the bulk. Okay, other questions? Uh, Sorry, maybe I missed this, but like, how, do you, how did we like um, get that expression for delta F as like- um, And waving. <laughs> this expression. Yeah, yeah, the second one. Yeah. yeah, this is just criterion of somehow, you know, it's really a guess. I mean, we just said, okay, let's assume that this picture of symmetry is correct and there's, there's this condensate with some phase. Now I'm twisting it. So I'm twisting it, things can only depend on the gradients of the phase. Uh, and then I just take the gradient squared and integrate it over the whole volume. So, you know, all of these are very just reasonable arguments and the limits A and L are small, but I, I can't predict the value of rho S, you know, to actually do a calculation, I have to pull out the value of rho S. So, so that I just, all my ignorance, I put in rho S. So all I'm saying is that it seems reasonable if I had a super condensate that this rho S is non-zero. Okay, so. This is very much, you know, I, how, this is exactly the way you do elasticity theory in the solid. You know, I don't know anything right. about how the atoms are interacting or anything. I just say, oh, well, there's some shear modulus and things should depend on the square of the strain. So I just write down some expression with that ex with that assumption. That's all. Right. 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 Like this but that like... doesn't allow me to compute the shear modulus. That's a whole different ball game. How do you compute the shear modulus? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. But in principle, you can now go back to BCS theory and compute the shear modulus by solving BCS, BCS theory with these twisted boundary conditions. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, that could be a fun problem, but I, I think I'll spare you from it. <laughs> but it can be done. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the value of these definitions is that it's, you know, it doesn't, depend upon whether you, uh, which ensemble you're in and going into these clustered, you know, states that have clustered decomposition versus they don't. This is all completely rigorous, where I just define a system in terms of how it responds to boundary conditions. So it's really the correct way to think about symmetry breaking. Uh, like I did here for the IZ model too. I mean, this is in fact, all these subtleties with, uh, you know, orders of limits of volume going to infinity and fields going to zero. No, I don't have to worry about any of that. I just look at two different boundary conditions and just by looking at that, I can tell you uh, whether there's a magnetization or not. Yeah. And these HL and HR could be almost anything. I don't even have to send them to zero or anything. I just have to take the volume to infinity, that's all. <laughs> Okay, uh, other questions? If not, uh, you know, please come to the discussion session tomorrow morning uh, at nine o'clock. Yeah, they've been quite, uh, quite fun so far, lots of good discussion. So yeah, if you can get up there early, <laughs> make it to those. All right, uh, there, and there's a section tomorrow also, right? Uh, how are you, we'll be covering uh, uh, yeah, so at, uh, tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m. we will talk about analytic properties of Prince functions and uh, what does it precisely mean uh, from a liquid in terms of uh, spectral weights. Yeah, I mean, it's all very useful information. I'll, I'll, yeah, which I don't know. We may use later in the course, but uh, yeah, it won't be crucial for this particular homework anyway. <laughs> but you can come with your homework questions also, so please have a look at the homework. Oh yeah, I guess I didn't show this. Yeah, so this is the reasoning which I said in words, which is now written out so to answer to one of your question. You know, we just assume that there's some phase associated with some um, post condensate, and then all we assume is that the energy cost is equal to the gradient of the phase square, and then that gives you this formula. This is the energy density cost. 
okay energy per unit volume uh, is gradient of phase square all right so see you soon bye